So I just do the video thing, I think. No, I should be in there now. There you are. Thank you. Okay, good evening, everyone. Looks like we have everyone here. I apologize for not getting on a little bit sooner. I tried to get on through the uh, city website, through the calendar, and <laughs> wasn't working. Anyway, okay, good evening. Um, this is the regu regularly scheduled meeting of the Trinidad Planning Commission for Wednesday, September 21st, 2022. Uh, first item on our agenda is our roll call. Trevor? Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Hakeman. Here. Commissioner Hopkins. Here. Commissioner Stockness. Here. And Commissioner Cole. Here. Okay, thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is approval of our minutes. We have one set of minutes from last month, August 17th. Uh, are there any questions, comments, corrections for the minutes? I had uh, two. Now, the first one was on page four, the first 
full paragraph beginning commissioner Hakenin. Um, the last sentence, um, I think to more adequately capture what I was trying to convey is that uh, some of the effective, he also questioned the OWTS impacts uh, for the additional room that the applicant represented as, that the applicant had represented as a sleeping room, even though it isn't a bedroom on the plans. Um, and then on page seven of eight, the last paragraph, um, it says, I asked about how much water sub area C would need. I'm not sure that that came from me. I thought somebody else may have asked that, but those are the two items. Uh, okay, so are you suggesting a change there, uh, Aaron? Yeah, I don't know if it's worth uh, staff going back and just, I don't know how they would possibly find it. It's a, you know, kind of a minor thing, but I'm just not sure it was, I don't recall asking about sub area C and the water demands. I remember discussion about it, but I don't recall me initiating it, but it wasn't the shortest meeting of, of my tenure. So I, my memory could be a little off at the end. That's all. <laughs> Understand. Um, well, it'll be in the uh, record of this meeting and we can get with Anton and make the changes. Yeah. Necessary. Uh, any other questions, comments on the uh, minutes? Dan? Page seven, where Aaron was. So um, Trevor said that the city should conduct a water rate <clears throat> analysis and an annexation study for further details. So Trevor, have you talked to them since the meeting? To who? To the city. Who would do that? Oh, um, I believe the city already has that plan. So NGH okay. would complete that. Yeah, because with the drought and all the water um, concerns, that would be um, good. And then the water committee would work on that too, the advisory committee. Are you on that, Aaron? Is he on that? He's gone. Okay. Um, yeah, Aaron acknowledged that he is on that water. Okay, advice. I think I think that's it, Richard. Thank you. Okay. Any others? Yeah, I had one on page four. Um, yeah, I said that it the the house was the plan was uh, beautiful. I agree that it's beautiful, but it's inappropriate for that site. It's not inappropriate for Trinidad overall. It's just for that site. Uh, which which paragraph are you looking at, uh, Tom? Page page four, third third paragraph down. Hopkins stated the design was beautiful and inappropriate for Trinidad. I do not agree with inappropriate for Trinidad. It's a beautiful plan, but it's just not appropriate for that site or for that project. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? Okay, I will, what I will suggest is I will contact Anton uh, when he returns. And I'll just ask him to review the uh, video of this meeting to pick up the uh, requested and suggested changes to the uh, minutes from last month. Okay, uh, if there are okay, no I, have, I have one more comment just as because of last month's uh, project on Ocean Avenue before you get to Hiller in McKinleyville are several homes on the bluff, you know, that look out to the ocean and several of them have crow's nests. So I just wanted you, you guys to know if you go down Hiller and then go ocean to um, you know, you're in McKinleyville, you can see that that's a more appropriate place for those kinds of buildings. Thank you. Thank you. There are no other corrections to the minutes, so I hear a motion to approve the minutes. Motion to approve with the suggested double checks for Anton. Second. Moved and second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, 
All in favor of approval of the minutes say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 This is unanimously. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is approval of our agenda for this evening. Uh, and this evening, we have three major items to discuss the general plan update for noise element, the general plan update for the figures one through 14, and then the housing related zoning ordinance update. Any requested changes to the agenda this evening? All right, seeing none, do I hear a motion to approve the agenda? Tom, your motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second? Second. Motion been approved and second. Any further discussion? Diane, was that a question or discussion or you're voting? <laughs> okay. Uh, all in favor say aye or raise aye. your hand. Motion carries. Uh, the agenda is approved. Next item on our agenda is items from the floor. This is an opportunity for anyone from the public to address the commission um, on any subject except for those subjects which are on the agenda this evening. We would appreciate you limiting your uh, comments to three minutes. Do we have anyone from the public who would like to address the commission? Yes, this, this is Jim Bilak, um, 860 Van Wick. Um, I'd like the commission to um, visit, I don't think revisit is the right word, uh, but the traffic flow down Edwards. And if you look at my icon, it's from that position. When you look down Edwards, you know, not when it's sunset, but during the day, um, there's uh, an indicator where Edwards goes down to the beach, but you can't see it. Okay, it goes. The, the the actual sign is on the 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 entrance to the marine lab. In any case, what I've noticed this past summer is there's been a large number of traffic going down Galindo. Um, these are like you know F three fifties pulling very large trailers and so forth, and they get stuck down there. And they can't figure out how to get out. And when you go towards um, back to Edwards along Van Wick, it's basically an alley. OK, so what I'd like the commission to visit is the both the signage as well as the um, um, the road. You know, there needs to be like bright yellow dashed lines going down the middle of the road, because when you're at that point, you know, again, looking back at where my um, icon is along Edwards and during the daylight, you look down there and you can see the entrance to Galindo, but you can't see where Edwards goes. So if there were better, you know, road, you know, yellow lines down the middle of the road, you know, dash lines, this sort of thing, then it would tell the, the driver. I mean, one uh, Sunday I went out to get the newspaper at Murphy's and I'm coming back following an F-250, I think it was, and the guy was about to go down Galindo, slammed on his brakes right in front of me uh, and then continued on Edwards because he, he thought that was the way down to the beach. So anyway, um, I'd like to have that put on the... Um, uh, somehow get into the process that that the the the, the road there needs to be uh, revisited that signage where the arrow is it really should be smack in the center it shouldn't be halfway up to the marine lab um, the uh, when I first complained about this the city council someone came down and cut some of the limbs on the evergreen tree that's there because they were actually blocking the sign. Um, so it's better than it was, but that sign is is old. It's it's very dirty. You can barely make it out. It should be in the center. It should have reflectors, this sort of thing. Anyway, that's my comment. Thank you, sir. Um, just for the record, uh, could you state your name and your address, please? Okay, I'll repeat that because I mentioned it at the beginning. Uh, <laughs> Jim Belak, B as in boy, E L A K, eight sixty Van Wick. Thank you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, I, I typically uh, we do not comment uh, directly on items from the floor. Uh, however, I will say that if you look at uh, our future agenda items, there is a signage master plan 
Yeah, yeah I know, I know, I know. That's why I'm attending this particular meeting. Okay. Because, um, who's the guys of the mayor? No, I forget his name. He mentioned that you guys would be talking to this. We will take it uh, under Thank advisement. You. Thank you. Thank you. Any other items from the floor? Okay, I am not seeing any. So we will close items from the floor and move on to our next agenda item, which is item one, general plan update, the noise element, discussion of an updated draft of the noise element. And I'll turn it over to staff for a report. Thank you. So um, I pulled out the old 2012 draft of, of the noise element. That was the last time we looked at it and I wasn't super happy with it. Um, I added some background information and it has some old noise readings uh, that need to be updated. So, you know, this is primarily an initial discussion about the noise element. Um, I'd like to get some input on what are the, the noise issues in Trinidad so that I can focus the, the policies of the general plan, um, some potential locations for some new noise readings. I'll be looking into what it might take to do um, uh, con noise contours on, on the roadways, um, probably just the main roadways and the highway. Um, since that is a requirement for a noise element, I don't know how much sense it makes for Trinidad um, to spend, you know, put a lot of effort into something like that. Um, but anyway, so this will be a continuing discussion and um, this is just, just the starting point. Okay, thank you. Um... Before we dive into this, are there any general questions or uh, clarifications uh, from the commission? And when I mean dive into it, I, I believe probably the easiest way is just to take it a little one page by page and uh, we can get into it there. But are any general questions or observations at this point? Uh, Tristan. Yeah, um, I have a couple of questions, um, I guess. In your staff report, Trevor, um, towards the bottom of the first page there, you you mentioned um, noise contours, and I wasn't sure what a noise contour was. Um, so maybe you could ex explain that to me or us. And then my other question is regarding the updated noise readings, um, which are from 2012, the ones we currently have. Um, I guess I'm not sure why those ones are not good enough or why they need to be redone or what the sort of the background to that is. Um, so if maybe if you could get some background on that too. Sure, both good questions. So no, noise contours are um, kind of lines along the roadway showing how far out, it's usually a, like a 65 and a 55 decibel noise contour. So instead of, you know, a contour following a line of topography elevation, it's it's following that line of where that noise level would be. Um, you know, there there's, noise is complex. Um, and so there are some complex modeling tools for, you know, dealing with different elevations and vegetation and, and different things that, you know, is beyond anything Trinidad um, would would need to do. Um, but there are some simpler ways to develop some, some noise contours that I can look into. Um, probably the 101 is going to be the, the biggest noise generator, but also the, the primary collector streets um, in town might be interesting as well. So that's what the noise contours are. Um, and then it's not that the 2012 data is no, isn't good anymore. It's just that it's 10 years old. And so, and it's also very, um, they're very simple noise readings with kind of a, a max and, and kind of a five minute average where, um, I have some more, I have some better equipment now. And so we can get some more, you know, like an hourly average or, or something that's a little bit more standard um, for noise reading. So 
Um, and so I want to focus probably on fewer locations, um, but get better noise readings. And, and we can repeat some of these places that we did in 2012 and see if the noise environment has changed um, as well. And, and then another thing to think about in addition to locations is timing. Um, so, you know, is it, is it, you know, peak hours, do we go out or do we, to get sort of a, a peak noise or um, would it be better to get, you know, more of an average, certainly wind and, and waves in, in Trinidad is a big noise generator. So that can affect noise reading. So we tried to go out on a calm day. Um, but yeah, so, so I would just like to get some updated uh, data and a little bit better data. Can I add a quick comment? Um, I, I have a PhD in physics, and um, noise is not just a um, a background thing. It also has a frequency. Mr. Spectrum. Bailey. Yes. Mr. Bailey. Th th there this will is be some... an opportunity for public comment. In just a okay, minute. fine, fine. I'll do it with that then, because um, you. you know this is something important. You're muted again, Richard. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just had a, a general question slash comment uh, just kind of clarifying trevor your intent tonight obviously this is just the um the noise element right as opposed to noise ordinance policy like there shall be noise so that's kind of a whole separate discussion to that point um in your staff report i i guess i i would like to see this come back kind of specific to developing a noise ordinance or enhancing it putting everything in one spot um, you know, the, the contract, the example you gave, the, the contract for events at town hall is one spot where there's things, what are acceptable construction, just, you know, kind of giving folks one spot, um, to look for that kind of stuff. And, uh, regarding the noise surveys, and I agree, some of the data needs to be updated. Um, and we'll get to that, but how long typically is it a week? Is it point collections? Um, you know, do you sit in the same spot for seven days with the, the equipment or not you, but you get my, my question there. Uh, it's usually an hour or 24 hours, um, and the equipment would be left in a secure location to, to take that reading over if it's a 24 hours. Um, I, I wouldn't sit there for 24 hours. So. so it wouldn't, though, necessarily capture seven days of data to see if there's weekly pattern changes to noise. I could look into whether we have the ability, how long we can do. Uh, you know, I think we can do several days, but I, you know, I think the battery runs out after... Um, a certain period of time, but I can look into the length of time that we can get. Okay, cool, thanks. That's it for now. Any other just general comments that, uh... okay, what I'm gonna do is maybe just a little unorthodox, but I will open up for public comment at this point, uh, because I know uh, Mr. Mr. Balick had a, had a question uh, and then we'll close it for public comment. We'll go back through and we'll dive into uh, the 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 uh, ordinance just a, or the element just a little bit more, and then we'll open it up for public comment as well as well afterwards. So, uh, Mr. Bailey, this is an opportunity for you to make public comment. I, I, th I think that when, when when Trevor commented about the the timing is is rather important, since since noise is not something that's it's a static a twenty four hour average is really not something um, significant. Um, so you need to do um, and, and and there's very good phone apps. I have a very good phone app, and, and even when you know I'm talking to you, I'm looking at a noise level of fifty fifty five de decibels. Um, so. 50 decibels is, is like we're talking at a normal room level volume. So at nighttime, whatnot, we should expect much lower, you know, like 40, 35 decibels and so forth, things like that. The uh, road 101 is a line source. And so you have to understand that it scales as you know one over R. So it's a there's a long distance associated with that. Whereas other sources like the, the casino, for example, is a point source and it scales as one over R squared. Anyway, I, I could explain this in greater depth, but for the moment, I, I suggest that we do more time specific data collection as well as location collection. Um, and so I think Trevor is absolutely correct in the time specific location collection. Um, and there's very good apps for the iPhone that can do this sort of thing. So we don't need any sophisticated equipment to do this well. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, 
Uh, Trevor, uh, again, just a couple of general general comments uh, or questions. Um, I, I uh, is this something that we should or could uh, suggest uh, coordinate with the city engineer? And the second part of the question is: Do they have additional equipment that we can use, or what? Um, well, I guess the question is, is it worth coordinating with the city engineer on this? Uh, potentially, um, but I I do know SHN does have, you know, kind of a top of the line piece of equipment that is, you know, legally defensible uh, noise meter. Um, so I would think, and, and I have some coworkers who have done noise studies, so, um, I don't know much about it, so I need to learn more about it, and I could um, check with GHD as well and see what kind of resources they have. Thank you. Yeah, the the, the uh, one consideration is the calibration of the uh, and and uh, uh, traceability of the equipment. So uh, we'll have to be careful about that as well. Okay. Any other uh, observations before we we can just go quickly through this? Uh, yes, we have one from. Council person Kelly. <laughs> Hi, it's just a general uh, kind of uh, comment about the noise element. Just my first pass of reading it uh, shortly before the meeting. It it does seem very technical, and I understand that this is a very technical topic. But if there's a way, I don't know if there is, but if there's a way to make it a little bit more layman's terms, uh, a little more accessible at the, especially at the the introduction, I think that would be great. But um, anyway, that's my only comment so far. Otherwise, it looks like it's off to a good start. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments before we move on? Okay. Um, I think perhaps the easiest thing is to just go through this. It's not very long. We can just go through it quickly, page by page. Um, obviously, as Trevor's pointed out, there's many things that will be updated, but uh, if there's any specifics that uh, we could help staff with, by all means, let's just do that. And I kind of resonate uh, with uh, what uh, Cheryl just said. Um, yeah, I, I, I think there has to be some way in which we can kind of uh, rethink this in maybe two separate ways or two separate sections the technical section and the section that uh, the layman can get their arms around to really appreciate what we're trying to do. Okay, having said that, uh, starting with uh, page one, anything on page one that anybody has a question about? I had a question on the last sentence in the first paragraph under purpose. Uh, it says the adopted noise element serves as a guideline for compliance with the state's noise installation standards. Um, would it be worthwhile to just reference what those where those standards are found? Sure, I can uh, do that, and that's um, I believe it's on the federal level too, but it's basically a, a forty-five decibel indoor noise level. So, um, and normally. Normal insulation, I think, is I forget if it's fifth. I think it's fifteen decibels is is standard insulation, and so um, you know if you're building housing within an area that's louder that has a louder ambient noise level than that, um, then you need more insulation. So that's the idea. Yeah, I just thought it would be good to maybe get the uh, behind what was behind it. Okay, anything else on page one? Page two. Nothing on page two, page three. This is where it gets kind of technical. Uh, yes, Dan. So um, that definition of terms is good because I wouldn't have any idea with all those. So thank you, Trevor. That's that's a good, um, good for us. And then I just, if you do some studies, we have to do nighttime noise and daytime noise, right? 
Okay. I'm That's there. right. And, um, you know, we were talking about timing and, you know, like, like Jim mentioned, people are more sensitive at night. And so that's what some of these weighted um, noise averages are so that um, it's a, a higher weighting at night um, because, because people are more sensitive to noise at night. Yeah, those pesky sea lions out there. <laughs> Right. Um, it, it, anything on the definitions themselves? Obviously, they're self-explanatory. Moving on to page four. I had one question in the first paragraph, uh, the first line. It is a small community with minimal traffic and noise pollution. Um, I, I, the sentiment of that is, you know, kind of within city limits, surface streets, collectors, that kind of stuff. But when you consider 101 bisects, kind of the eastern edge of town, I'm not sure that statement's necessarily as accurate. Um, that was just kind of my thought on that one. I, I don't know if there's a way to suss that out a little bit. But then you kind of go on in the next one other than Highway 101, so I don't know, be a little further down after the green line. Um, that was all on page four for me. Yeah. So, Trevor, what about some... Um... Trinidad is a small community with some traffic and noise pollution. It's not minimal, I'll tell you that anymore. It's not minimal. And with the, the school, you know, and the beachcomber and the winery and the homeless, it's, it's not minimal. So maybe take that out. Actually, I think when we looked at this in 2012, that was one of the first comments that we made as well. So <laughs> message understood. Any other issues on page four? I had just a couple of real fast. Um, and, and this was something that we had talked about before as well. Um, after the strikeout where you say, other than Highway 101, other factors influence noise level, Etc. Our low-flying Coast Guard helicopters. I suggest we change that to aircraft for a more generic um, aviation look. It's not always just the Coast Guard. It could be uh, other things as well. Uh, other other aviation uh, uh, kinds of things. Um, the other thing I'm surprised that we didn't say anything about were was harbor noise. And uh, this, this gets into the real cyclical uh, issue because uh, certain times of the year, certain times of the crabbing season, fishing season, et cetera, it's going to be totally different than uh, otherwise. So uh, going back to what we were saying earlier about the surveys, um, we, we may need, you know, I don't know what, how much time you had allocated for doing the uh, noise surveys, but as been pointed out already, um, there's a lot of cyclical type noise in town and the harbor in my mind is, is one of, one of the big contributors at certain times of the year. So we'll have to figure out how we address that. Um, yeah. And, and, and we don't have to take it out, but again, the whole issue of the emergency site works. Oh, well, okay. I, I was just about to say emergency siren for like tsunami, but we also have the firehouse too. So I forgot that. Yeah. Strike what I just said. Okay. Um, Richard, before you go on, um, you mentioned the harbor, but um, it's Edwards. Mr. Balek, there is a time for public. Yes, comment, I understand. And I will come back and I will give you an opportunity. <laughs> let us do our job and then we'll let you do yours. Um. Anything else on page four? Yeah, Tristan. Yeah, um, <clears throat> under traffic noise, the second to last paragraph, that last sentence that um, you added there that's printed in red about traffic volume, not having a major influence on traffic noise levels. I mean, it is considerably when there's no traffic on Highway 101 in, in the early mornings. And at night, it's a lot quieter, um, at least at my house, up the hill. And I mean, I, I, I get like maybe like whether there's a medium amount of traffic or a lot of traffic, there's, there's maybe not a lot of 
difference in noise, but if it's like zero versus say 50% traffic load, it's, it is more significant. Well taken. I have the same thing at my house. So yeah, I'll add once at a certain level, I think is, is what it is. Yeah. Uh, Tom? And yeah, I was going to mention one on one too. The uh, going up that hill and towards you know Barry, that sound's got to get louder. Going up that hill, and there's times when they come down with the track brakes, and it just it's just crazy how how loud it is um, in the early mornings. And there used to be one guy that would just do it. It's like seven o'clock in the morning. Um, is there any way we could petition for a sign? or some kind of like keep your brakes at a minimum, or, I mean, I know that's a little different than right now, but it is a really big, it is very loud at times. Is that on 101 or Barry? That's on 101, but it, the sound goes right up Barry. That would probably to have to track. go through Caltrans. Um, I can look into what, you know, what kind of documentation they might need for, for a sign like that. Cause those kind of signs do exist. I have seen them. It might be nice for a lot of people around Trinidad. It's a great point, Tom, potentially getting that information, what they need ahead of the noise surveys. So we know what to listen and how to listen to see if we can. Um, I had one more question on page four, if there was nothing else in the, the last paragraph there where you talk about differences in elevation, you know, and do have a really nice explanation paragraph. I don't know if that was struck in an effort for brevity, but with uh, kind of the sentiment to make this more user friendly to the layperson, I think that is a nice job of, um, you yeah, know, that might be something to incorporate elsewhere or just to keep somehow. Okay. Anything else on page four? Page five. I had a couple things on page. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Diane. Didn't see your head up. Uh, one, two, three. Under aircraft noise. Uh, the last two sentences, airport noise studies are performed for the Arcata Airport Master Plan. So I guess we changed those words, Trevor, Trevor to the new airport name. And um, it says it indicates that airport airport noise is not an issue in Trinidad. Well, it is an issue. But the new flights, when they we had six flights, there was quite a bit of noise right above the head. And then on Sundays or weekends, we have small planes that, fly right over the community. We're used to the Coast Guard, you know, and they're they're pretty good. They're they're out over the water close to um the bluff, but we're used to that. So um I don't know, we need to do a little rewording on that paragraph. Okay. Karen? Um, to that point specifically, um, I kind of having worked for an airline at a major airport for a long for a number of years. Um, there's the issue of the noise generated by the airport facility itself versus flight path and flight traffic. So that might be the thing. While we're not affected necessarily by airport noise, depending upon runway configurations due to weather and general aviation traffic that's increased, there's more of an impact in town. Something along those lines uh, might kind of hit both those points. Um, on page five also just, uh, I had noted the 2001 uh, personal communication with Caltrans personnel. You know, that's 21 years ago, um, obviously. So that's a bit, maybe we can find the same person to talk to or do some studies for that. And then the next paragraph beginning city streets, um, I wanted to add in uh, trucks you have to drive through town to make deliveries to the Harbor area um, and shopping center. Um, and then add in View Avenue as well, because there's a, obviously I'm extra sensitive given my location in town, but are extra aware, I should say, but the shopping center generates a decent amount of noise uh, in particular in the mornings and then in, and Wednesday is their main freight day currently. So um, just something to think about or get added in there. But that's it for me on page five. Thanks.
Okay, just a couple of other comments. Um, the third paragraph starting according to common practice, um, I, I, the, the, I think that's good information, but it seemed a little inappropriate to have under traffic noise since it dealt with unshielded residential development. So I, was, I would suggest we move that under someplace under stationary noise sources, perhaps, or somewhere else. I mean, I think it's good info, as I said, but uh, it's, I, it wasn't clear to me that it should be in traffic noise, in the traffic noise section. So one, that's one consideration. Um, then under stationary noise sources, again, uh, not to quibble, but uh, the last full sentence there says, other substantial noise sources include tourists, winds and uh, wa wind and waves. Um, yeah, tourists do contribute to noise, but um, it wasn't clear to me why we were not including again the harbor noise and also um, the, the, the restaurants in town operate a number of refrigeration units, air conditioning units, et cetera. And um, I've even heard of complaints in the past about those. So uh, maybe we should include restaurants or some way to make it a little bit more general as opposed to specific, uh, specifically three things. Okay, anything? Uh, yes, Kristen. Um, I guess sort of piggybacking on you, Richard, the, the note about tourists in this, I feel like that doesn't fit in the stationary noise sources category because it's not particularly stationary. I don't know exactly where the best place to put it, but, um, and then also, uh, I guess I want to add Barry Road to the truck traffic street list. Um, cause it's actually, there's actually a lot of big truck traffic on Barry Road, um, which is actually really noisy. And what's the generator of that? Is that the, the guano? Yeah, that's the guano. Yeah. It's like, I mean, it's better now, but it was like almost every day. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions on, um, page five? Page six. Um, well, uh, my, my general comment is that, yes, uh, the, the data needs to be updated, obviously. So um, much of this, I, I, I think that the uh, table is great, but uh, the data has to be updated. Um, the... Um, Two comments, though, is that I might suggest that um, we take a noise measurement in uh, the area of Janus Court um, because that wasn't there when we did this initially, or, or originally, I should say, and uh, might be useful. There is parking area up there. There's tourists. There's uh, visitors, lots of activity, so it might be useful. To, and, and it's right there on Patrick Point Drive as well. Um, the other very nitty thing is that the, the Patrick's Point Drive Recycling Center is no longer there. So we could just strike that uh, I, uh, item in uh, the um, parentheses. But I think the key is uh, really getting uh, updated data and putting together the process to get that data and length of time it takes and the early complex method in which we're going to have to do it. Any other questions or comments from commission on this page? Okay, um, as I said, this was just uh, 11 pages long. What I'm, Again, I'm gonna deviate from normal processes and I, I know that there was some public comment. So I'll open it for public comment. And uh, if anyone has any uh, comments on the first six pages, um, now, uh, if you would uh, like to speak now, uh, we'll be glad to hear you. So Richard, just to follow up on your comment and Aaron's comment. So on pages four and five, I think Edwards needs to be called out. And in particular, people tend to come through visitors primarily and particular ones with you know traveling um, large pickups, um, with large trailers and so forth. They tend to go carefully through downtown 
And then when they reach the T intersection, turn right onto Edwards, that's when they tend to speed up and, and the noise increases significantly. So somehow Edwards in that section from the T to uh, the beach needs to be called out. And this is both, you know, it's, it's, it's um, harbor traffic, it's beach traffic, as well as restaurant traffic. Good point. Thank you. Hi, guys. Uh, can I ask a question real quick? Yes, this it's is... open for public comment. Just uh, state uh, your name and your address, or you state your name. <laughs> uh, Anna Davis, uh, as my thing says, I'm at 558 Hector, and uh, I'm new in town. And uh, I guess my question is, what is the ultimate goal of the noise study or of the noise discussion? Uh, we are in the process of updating uh, the city's general plan, um, and the noise element is one of the state required elements. And to, and to have some background information on noise levels is part of the state's requirements for the city's noise element. So, um, so one, we're meeting state requirements, but also. I think noise has become more of an issue in town since this was last um, written. And so we want to be able to focus on where those issues are and, and how to solve them. So that's, that's the idea of what we're doing. Okay, great. And is the bus in part of the noise study? Uh, I don't believe the bus is mentioned in here. I just ask because goes past my house and it does not bother me because I'm from Los Angeles and it is just peaceful as all get out for me and my husband, honestly. So uh, I don't have LAPD helicopters circling my house all times of day. Uh, but yeah, I just figured mention the bus as a thing that makes noise. Thank you for your comment. You're welcome. Any other public comment before I close it and move on? Okay, I'll close public comment and turn. Oh, it Rick, Richard, before you close, um, I forgot to mention that I, I was told years ago that um, there was a thought of putting um, um, speed bumps or traffic humps along Edwards, and that was vetoed. And I can imagine the reason being that a lot of people haul their boats along there to the harbor. And so I don't know. I don't think that's the right solution, but I, I know that that has been considered in the past. You're absolutely correct. Uh, yeah, it's been, I hate to say, probably three years since we looked at that. Um, and uh, that's not to say that we might need to look at it again for just these, for another set of reasons other than uh, what was uh, uh, originally addressed several years ago, but thank you. Yes, appreciate it. Yeah, and, and, and speed hubs can be designed um, in a way, I know that the ones that, you know, in our home in the Bay Area, that they're designed so that, you know, fire trucks in particular can go through efficiently because they have, you know, wedges in certain distances. So they can be appropriately designed so that someone tr calling a boat down to the harbor doesn't have to go bumping over the boat, over the hump. Yeah, let's remain, remind ourselves of these comments if that uh, project comes up again. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, okay, uh, hearing no other public comment, I'll close it and we'll move on and finish off then uh, the first uh, first uh, scrub of uh, the noise element. So on page uh, seven, anything on page seven? Yes, Diane. <laughs> the last line. Uh, for areas where the existing noise environment is unacceptable, new development should generally not be undertaken because there may not be sufficient noise reduction measures to bring the development into compliance with the noise policy in this element. So I'm trying to figure out construction noise and time of day because we had an issue on Wagner where you know they started at nine in the morning and they finished at nine at night and then they started up again on Sunday morning and it wasn't anything quiet so do we need a little subcategory Trevor for construction noise 
Yeah, I mean, intermittent noise, you know, construction noise is, it's pretty standard to have some limitations and we do have limitations in the grading ordinance, but I suppose if it was a private, you know, just constructing a house, uh, you know, adding on to a house that wasn't grading, um, that wouldn't have come up, but, um, you know, we might think about starting to include that as a, it could be a condition of approval for, for projects. Um, but that would also be something that would be in a noise ordinance. Um, and certainly we could have a policy in this general plan to address intermittent noise like construction. Well, are there hours for construction or not? In the grading ordinance, there are. But, you know, if it, like I said, if it were an addition to an existing house that wasn't, you know, a grading permit, that wouldn't necessarily apply. I think that's the only place I know of that that exists in Trinidad. Um, we do, you know, if we if it's a project that requires an environmental document, we usually include construction hours as a mitigation measure. Um, but we can certainly start adding that as a condition of, of, you know, on design review as well. Okay, you know, especially if we're going to get ADUs and, you know, different housing um item so okay it it was an issue twice um you know that i didn't think was appropriate friday night and sunday morning thank you yes Tristan. um i mean is that that's more something that would be covered in like an actual noise ordinance rather than in the element is that is that correct and like is I think I have seen policies in noise ordinances that set hours for construction. Um, so it could go in a noise element. To me, it seems more appropriate for a noise ordinance. Um, but I think you could go either way or both. Okay. Uh, Tom. I'd like to throw out a couple of things that just, I don't know if we can do anything about it or not, but the quarry is loud and Ocean Grove at times is out of control, but always fun. So anyway, those are just a couple of things. Um, quarry, uh, the, the Rancheria has done a really good job with their sound from my perspective. And I'd like to, you know, congratulate them, but um, it, it, anyway, just, I don't know if there's anything we can do about it, but at times it, those both Corey and Ocean Grove are, were, have been just crazy loud. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I had just one comment here. It's uh, one, two, three, four, or the fifth paragraph. It's just one sentence. Uh, Trevor, where you say where the noise exposure is acceptable for intended land use, new development may occur without requiring an evaluation of the noise element. Um, you know, on, on one sense, I understand why this is a pretty generic statement, but on the other, do we want to describe um, what is acceptable for the intended land use and um, and, and I'm a little worried about that the development may occur without requiring an evaluation. Now, is your intent then to maybe tie this down in the ordinance itself? Um, in terms of the acceptability, that would be from table N3. So that's the noise use compatibility matrix. And that statement probably applies more to where we have where we would have noise contours, um, so you know, again, normally si sixty is normally acceptable for most uses, um, and so you know, is there is there a noise generator in Trinidad besides the roadways that that consistently generate sixty decibels? I don't know. Um, but that's kind of the idea is that through the noise study, we would find out, um, you know, where those areas are that exceed those kind of levels. And then if a project is outside those areas, then you don't have to do a noise study. If a project is inside those areas, you have to do a noise study 
or or you can't can't construct the development. Okay, I, I think I see where you're headed. Um, okay, that's that's fine for right now. Yeah. Okay. Anything else on page seven? Moving on to page eight. Yes, Diane. So, Trevor, on um, <clears throat> the matrix, the last one, the last category, industrial, manufacturing, utilities, agriculture, can we add in construction or is the matrix set in stone? Or, or are we going to the do the ordinance for that? It's not necessarily set in stone, but I think um, this is for, so what this is saying is that if you're gonna put in an industrial use, these are the no, these are the acceptable levels. So it's not, these are the acceptable noise impacts on the use, as opposed to the noise impacts of the use, if that makes sense. So these are the noise levels for the environment, um, existing environment, and what's acceptable for those land uses, um, as opposed to something like regulating the noise output from construction. Okay, thank you. Anything else on uh, page eight, page nine? Oh, I have a couple comments. Um, uh, another editorial comment, uh, wherever I see program, I get a little nervous uh, only because this is one more thing that the city would be responsible for doing. Um, and, and I'm not sure that, I, I, I quibble about the first three there, uh, one, two, and three. Okay, I, I would, wouldn't mind leaving those alone, but when you get down to um, NO1.22, um, which is the wind noise sources have been identified. Uh, that to me is not a policy. That, that to me is uh, more of a policy than a program. Uh, but again, I'll, I'll wait until we actually see this thing come back together. Uh, but I do worry about uh, these program versus policies. And the other question was, and I'm surprised, Diane, you didn't jump on this, um, uh, 1.4 restrict truck traffic to designated routes. Um, uh, well, first I was all, leaving it for you. Oh. <laughs> and for Aaron, because Aaron's got all the um, the trucks right on Wednesday, in the, right behind the market. Um, obviously, that's going to raise a, a fair amount of discussion. And um, uh, if nothing else, I think we need to designate what those truck routes are at some point. Yes, Aaron. Um, one that just jumped out to me that I missed on my first reading is uh, 1.3. It's kind of right there that we need to develop a, a comprehensive noise ordinance for the city. And I agree wholeheartedly, given all the discussion we've had tonight, it sounds like there's definitely a need. And like I said, I'd like to get that all kind of in one place. You know, like Trevor, you said, there's, you know, some places you can't use a weed whacker or a leaf blower prior to, you know, there's that kind of stuff. Um, you know, something that keeps, you know, me from cutting wood until midnight and, you know, affecting my neighbors because it's, we're all close to each other. Good comment. Anything else on page nine? All right, page 10. Well, page 10 is completely deleted and anybody wants to add anything there. I'll also just add in then the uh, the um, uh, the map, figure 16. And obviously this may change as we get into the noise evaluation process. Okay, any other comments from commissioners on the, uh, yes, Kristen. Yeah, this is just more of an overall comment. Um, just we're talking about construction noise and various um, noises that may occur at people's houses. Um, and I know we're not creating the noise ordinance right now, but I guess one of my concerns 
I have like, it's sort of a two-sided concern. Um, one, like regarding construction noise, uh, I, I would be, I guess, nervous to like limit construction noise to, you know, weekdays between 8 and 5 p.m. because I feel like that really punishes anybody who might want to be doing anything on their own, their own work on their own house, if they because who also has a job, they wouldn't be able to do that in the evenings or on the weekends or something like that. Um, and maybe they don't want to or can't afford to hire somebody to do that sort of work. Um, and then, of course, the other flip side is like, something that really, I guess, bugs me, maybe like construction noise bugs Diane is like leaf blowers, I just think are the worst. And they, I feel like those are often, most homeowners that don't own leaf blowers, I don't think, but it's more of a symptom of like people who have gardeners have leaf blowers. And like, I've seen it at least where I grew up, you know, it's like as neighborhoods gentrify people hire gardeners and then everyone's got a gardener that comes by once a week and blows and mows and blows and it turns into a real nuisance um and i don't really know how to like regulate that but um and i don't think this element is actually the place to do that but i just wanted to express my concerns um if if when if and when we move forward with creating a, an ordinance I, I do recommend that you um, you look through those city council packets that I, I referenced because um, the city did draft a noise ordinance and on a on a quick review of it I, I thought it was pretty good in terms of what kind of covering the, the issues and it did it definitely addressed garden tools, power, power tools. Um, and I do think that it would be good to differentiate like commercial construction versus, you know, somebody doing their individual project. Um, but that should be limited too. just like you can't have a leaf blower out. You can't be, you know, running your bandsaw, at right. whatever. Um, so yeah, no, I think those are good points, but I, I do, I do encourage you to look at that ordinance. Cause I, I think it, like I said, I, I think it covers things and, but if there's things that are missing, those might be things to make sure we bring up here. Gotcha. Yeah. I did not look at the ordinance. So thanks for highlighting that for me. Hey, Trevor, just to confirm, that's only a draft ordinance so far. Cause I did look at the muni code and I didn't see anything. Okay. All right. Cool. I'll dive for that too. I missed that. Okay. Any other uh, comments on um, this agenda item? Uh, hearing none, I'll open it up for public comment on this agenda item, the noise um, policy, noise element. Richard, uh, this is Jim again. Um, I, I, I sympathize or I, I empathize with Tristan. I too am particularly sensitive to the frequency spectrum of the leaf blower. And my observation is it's not a question of gentrification. It's a question of the absentee um, homeowner, perhaps putting the homes up for Airbnb. Those are the ones that are particularly, you know, the landscape maintenance people. Um, and in terms of, of the homeowner doing their own work around the house, um, I think it's more common to allow, um, you know, a time of like 8 a.m. to 9 p.m for you know homework you know in, in terms of around the house um you know the quiet time might be after 9 p.m or something so there, there's you know a reasonable number there i don't know what the right number for trinidad is but uh, i think a reasonable number for, so that homeowners can do their work after working hours but yeah, Tristan in particular, I, I, I empathize with you. And I, you know, the, the leaf blowers, and thank God that California is now going to outlaw the sale of gas powered leaf blowers. Thank you for your comment. Any other public comments? Okay. Thank you for that discussion. Our next item agenda is the general plan update of the figures one through 14. Uh, Trevor, anything you want to say on for a staff report there? Yeah, uh, let me 
first let me apologize um can I, i'm gonna have to take two minutes and run to the restroom real quick oh Sorry okay um we'll take a um, two minute break two minutes is good thank you okay Okay, we're waiting for a quorum here. All right, we're just waiting for Diane. Okay, I think we're all back. Um, all right, so uh, we are on our next agenda item, the general plan update figures, one through 14. Uh, Trevor? Yeah, so these are the long awaited figures. Um, that, that was a, a big hurdle for a while to, to get through these um, and get updated figures. Most of them you have seen in an earlier form with, with other elements. Um, and then I also included the existing zoning ordinance. Now, I do want to point out this is not the official zoning ordinance, that first map in there, the land use and zoning map. Um, like I said, it's not the officially adopted map, but it's it's pretty close, at least, you know, parcel by parcel. So I gave that for you to compare with figure two, uh, the proposed land use designations. Um, and I included a summary of all the changes that were made. Um, so I just want to want you to review those and provide any input. Uh, figure one, um, I'm kind of excited about some of these figures, but figure one is a brand new figure. Um, we had our, our geologists map the bluff edges in, in Trinidad using both some uh, LIDAR and then um, field verification because the uh, appealable area is based on, you know, whether it's between the sea and the first public road, whether it's within 300 feet of a bluff, um, 100 feet of a creek. So, um, and, and the bluff edges are also important for the exemptions. If you recall, um, within 50 feet of a bluff, things aren't exempt. So, so this map um, was, was a fair amount of work in terms of, so everything below the mean high tide line is, is within the state's uh, retained jurisdiction. So the Coastal Commission retains jurisdiction for CDPs. Um, and then you have the the yellow is the areas that are where coastal development permits are appealable to the Coastal Commission. And then the orange area are where CDPs are not appealable to the Coastal Commission. Now, currently, 
Underwood, since it does not continue all the way to that state park road, was not designated as the first public road. So currently it's designated as Trinity Street, but I think even staff agree with me that that's, that really it should probably be Underwood. Um, but I, I assume Coastal Commission will have a lot to say about this map. And then you can see the coastal zone and, and the tiny little green portion of the city that's not in the coastal zone. Um, so that's a brand new map. Um, and then you've got kind of the, the land use designations and state and federally owned land. And then uh, figure four is, um, you know, like the water service area, the sphere of influence, um, the planning area. Uh, figure five shows generalized land use outside of city limits. So that's county zoning, basically. Uh, figure six are the watersheds. So the city's planning area is based on watersheds. And so these are, um, again, generated in, in the GIS, so more accurate than, than past data that we've had. Figure seven A and B show the uh, special status species um, in the city's planning area, and it's broken down by um, sort of categories of living things. Uh, figure eight is a new, you know, we've had a map that shows questionable stability and stable, and I, I don't, that data that that was based on is kind of, seems to be lost. Um, and I don't know exactly where that's from. I think maybe percent slope uh, might be, it, it, it's a common um, way that development is, is regulated de depending on the slope. Um, and so this, this map here shows um, less than 15% slope, which is generally considered not an issue. Um, in areas between 15 and 30% slope, you have to have special engineering and soil studies and things like that. And then generally areas greater than 30% slope are, are considered not developable. Uh, figure nine is, uh, these are the NRCS uh, soil um, units. So, um, in 2020, that so um, this this is fairly new data where they've mapped um, the the Trinidad area and they they finally published that in 2020. So these are their um, soil mapping units, and then I kind of categorized them by limitations. So you can see, um, you know, there's some some prime farm land, um, areas of steep slopes, areas that are poorly drained. Um, and then there's a few soils with without limitation. So that's that map. And then, and then I think some of these these ones going on. You've probably seen the trails map. This is a pretty simplified version, just showing trails and vista points and the coastal trail. And then Figure Eleven you recently saw with the circulation element. Figure Twelve. Uh, Oh. Oh, you get you didn't get the version with the X's, did you? Oh uh, shoot. Okay. So Aaron Aaron did some ground truthing of these uh, benches and bike racks. Um, and there's a couple of benches that are not on the map and then several benches that no longer exist. So I will be updating the map. Um, one of the things is that there's a bike rack kind of tucked away behind Salty's, and that seems to be the only bike rack in town. Um, and I do think that there are a lot of bicyclists um, in in town, and so and I, the city does have some money for for park improvements, which would include bike racks. Um, I also suggested bike lockers, so I think. Um, if the planning commission has some some recommendations, that might be something that the city could actually implement in the short term. And then figure 13 is an updated stormwater map. It also shows the LID infiltration areas. And oh, and then the water service area 14.
Okay, thank you. Um, for planning commissioners, are there any general comments before we look at the specific maps? Aaron? I just had a general comment kind of getting caught up on the uh, changes coming uh, to the zoning. Um, I guess my first question is, one, are, have those already happened and been approved by a previous commission or council? And then the follow-up to that, for example, the plan development to the mixed use um, and, you know, the PR being uh, returned PC. And I guess my question on that is, where can I find those new descriptors that I can see what activities are allowable under that? Is it just simply a nomenclature change and we're just going to strike out, for example, PR and make it PC or um, just, I guess those are kind of my, my questions on that. Yeah, good questions. Um, for now, yes, it's just a nomenclature change. Um, but we are going to be updating the zoning ordinance. So we are also going to be updating those zones and the allowable uses in those zones. I don't expect them to change a whole lot, but I imagine, you know, we're going to add some uses, maybe take some uses away, maybe make things more general. But yeah, so we will be updating those zones. For now, they're they're primarily nomenclature changes. Um, Is other there... Than that, oh, Go ahead. Sorry, Harbor, for example, that one was commercial previously and is now a new one. So that so, will. Yeah, so that is a good point. That is a new zone. Uh, currently, the Harbor area is not certified by the Coastal Commission. So it is an area of deferred certification. The Coastal Commission did not certify the city's commercial zoning of that. They didn't feel it was protective enough of coastal dependent uses. It was, you know, cause it's more of a general commercial designation. At one point the city did try and designate a harbor area um, and the Coastal Commission rejected it. At the time there was some question as to the status of of the the harbor the mooring field primarily and whether the city did actually have have ownership of that from state lands commission um normally it's state lands commission that owns water below the mean high tide um but that was granted to the city back uh, i think mid 80s um I believe that happened. So, and then yes, yeah, so the planning planning commissions in the past, uh, the like the last time we were talking about the land use element in 2018, uh, did review these changes. Um, other than that parcel along Mill Creek, um, so that's one. That's the one that's highlighted. Um, and then also along the shoreline because we had the city of lim limits at the parcel boundaries and we found that city limits actually extends to the high tide line which is well beyond what the parcel boundaries showed so i i made some adjustments along the shoreline um primarily shoreline areas that are publicly owned are open space and shoreline areas that are privately owned are special environment um and then in the harbor i kind of followed along where the area is developed on an aerial photo to, to do that zoning. So I tried to make it more accurate. Um, so, yeah. And then just one final, so all the changes you've listed out here still would need to come before the planning commission and go through the whole process before they would become official. Is that, am I understanding that's, this correctly? Like for example, correct. the Prairie yeah. Road bar. So, okay. So these are just kind of the list of things that are, in the pipeline, so to speak, nothing we do. This is just, okay, thank you. But this will, I mean, this is, you know, figure two is going to be the basis of the new zoning map. So, um, you know, it, it's gonna go back to the plan, the Coastal Commission. I know they're gonna have more comments. There's gonna be more iterations of this, but, you know, once it's recommended by the Planning Commission to the City Council, um, that will be the basis of, of the new zoning map. Kristen? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I guess I, I had a question or maybe a comment about the that one parcel on Mill Creek um, that you want to rezone. Uh, has, have you 
have, has anyone reached out to the landowner um, and asked for their opinion on that? I guess I feel like that would be an appropriate opinion to get before. Yes, we... um, I think we, I, I agree. I think we should do that as well. Normally, I mean, really it's going from open space, which is not developable to, and it, it that parcel was owned by the city for many years and then sold when, when the city had some financial trouble. And I know probably the owners bought it just so it couldn't be developed. Um, and so they might want to keep it open space, but yes, I, I would definitely um, touch base with them at, at some point. If, if the planning commission even thinks it should be changed, I just did it. It seemed a little out of place to have it as open space when it's no longer city owned. Um, and that's why, but I want to get planning commission input on, on that. And I, you know, access to that parcel <clears throat> is an issue. Um, so maybe it should say open space and that's, that's what I'd like to get input on. Is that figure two, um, Trevor? Yes. And, and Tristan. Okay. Uh, another sort of, I guess, side question. It looks like the city um, city limits have changed out in out in the ocean in the bay in the past, however many years. Maybe that old. The, the city limit didn't actually change. It was mapped incorrectly on that old figure. Gotcha. Okay. Diane. I'm okay. Okay. Yeah, I like all the figures, um, Trevor. I just didn't know you mentioned something about Trinity Street should be labeled somewhere underwood, but part it says Parker instead of uh, underwood. But which figure is that? I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> it might be. Um, I don't think it's. It's not the trails. Um, it's it's the corner, you know, by the the uh, that the museum, oh, that the art museum. So is that is that Parker? And then it runs in after the rain. Um, Garden, it runs in and it's Underwood. Yeah. Yeah. And then going down the hill, it's, um, I don't know what it is. Is H it Hector? Hector. Hector. No, Galindo. No, Hector. Yeah. Galindo is the other <clears throat> street. Okay. Yeah. I think they're really, really nice maps and figures. Thank you. Uh, so I had. Uh... Uh, just one general comment uh, before we uh, go through them in a little bit more detail. Um, yeah, these are all very good. Uh, the issue that I have is that they're great in color, but if they are translated into black and white, it's going to be virtually impossible to uh, have people understand them. So uh, there's, there, there's no reason or no way that we can prevent people from uh, doing that. But I just wonder if maybe we should have some sort of disclosure or warning that on the map saying that uh, if you reproduce this map, you do it at your own risk uh, or something like that, uh, at, at least to um, alert them that if you're looking at a black and white version of this, it's gonna be very difficult to interpret. So um, I unfortunately can't give you what I think would be a good set of words right now, but I just think we need to kind of, as we go through this, make sure that uh, that we're, we're clear that uh, certain um, certain uh, of these maps will just be very difficult to uh, interpret otherwise if they're not the original or in color. Um, okay, I think I think we can go through these fairly quickly if we if we decide here is that the pleasure of the commission we could just go through one map at a time and go from there. okay. Um, actually I should say are there any, um, questions on page two, which was the um, listing of uh, changes to uh, zoning. And we've talked about a little bit. 
but any other uh, questions or requests for comments, uh, uh, requests for explanation? And just, I'm sorry, one last time for my brain clarifying, these are all proposed changes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Trying to wrap my head around everything. Yeah. Okay. Um, while the first map there, which is just called land use and zoning, is basically overcome by events, uh, I did have one question, Trevor, and it, it will show up again on uh, figure two is I thought where there was a special designation for the um, weather station, weather facility on um, the head, uh, but you show it as um, open space. Is it uh, open space? It is open space. Um, I mean, it could almost, it should almost be a whole in the zoning since it's federal land the city zoning has no meaning there yeah it, it, it something <laughs> i don't know what what it would be but yeah uh tom uh yeah back on the uh on the the zoning page the first one it mill creek doesn't look right with the the um i mean it's not okay so that's going to be proposed i just didn't know the difference between a special environment and open space so open space is more restrictive than special environment special environment is is still fairly restrictive in terms of development um and so basically that so the creek is, that was generated based on LIDAR data. Um, and the zoning, the special environment zoning is a, is 100 feet from the creeks, on all the creeks. Um, it's either open space or special environment within 100 feet of all the creeks. Thank you. And Trevor, are most of these special environments near the shore, the shoreline? Yeah, so um, the special environment, like if you look along the southeast portion of the city, those, the where, where those lines fall are based on the old unstable versus questionably stable lines. And I'm not proposing to change those at all. Just because I don't, I don't really have a, a good reason to change them, unless they were going to follow bluff edges potentially. Oh, okay. Um, moving on. Figure one: jurisdictions. This replaces that uh, old black and white with the yellow highlighter kind of stuff. This is fantastic. If that's what it is, this is fantastic. I love this. Um, nice work, Trevor. Um, I did have two questions or one question kind of in two locations um, with the relative to the bluff edge that you're, that the staff geologist did. I understand obviously the difficulty in the Mill Creek and Makata's Mill Creek uh, mapping that there but i don't understand um the two other gaps the one kind of um i guess if you will just beneath uh the frame property uh and then the one going down into the harbor and i i just want to verify that those gaps are not in the continuity enough to generate any concerns with being located within a bluff edge that kind of stuff for current or future development yeah, um, and like I said, and I, I do have the background uh, report that goes with this. If anybody's interested, I can certainly provide it. And I, I imagine that there will be eventually some back and forth between the Coastal Commission geologist and the, the, the city's geologist here. Um, so that lower area, though, where it drops down below Wagner, 
I think that is pretty well established um, that there is a low there is a low terrace. So the way the coastal bluff is defined that it's the it's the first first coastal bluff. And so there and you know and you're probably all familiar that the geology is very terraced here where you get you know an uplift and so you get these bluffs and you get these terraces. Um, that's how the geology is. And there is a remnant terrace. And so um, uh, Cheryl Kelly's property is sitting on, on that lower terrace. The Churai Village is sitting on that lower terrace. Um, but it does not extend, you know, past Ocean Avenue there. And so mm -hmm. that's, why it, that's why it pops up. Um, the other gaps are because it is the coastal facing bluff. So, like, there is another... There is a bluff edge above the harbor parking lot that would connect those two, but it's not a coastal bluff. It's not subject to wave action. So, and and also up by Mill Creek. So there are bluffs that continue there if you follow the line, but they're not subject to wave action. So that's how the coastal bluff is defined. Um, and so that's how they, they were mapped and it is, you know, when we have to determine what's 50 feet from a bluff, a coastal bluff, you know, it, it might take some interpretation in some of these areas, but that's that's what the geo geologists determine based on the Coastal Commission's definition of, of a bluff, a, coast, okay. a coastal bluff. And it is 50 feet from a coastal bluff is? So 50 feet how, from how a does coastal bluff. I... 50 feet from a coastal bluff is the coastal development permit exemptions that we worked on a few months ago. Um, so there are no exemptions that apply within 50 feet of a bluff. For the appeal area, it's 300 feet from, from a bluff. And really, the only place that comes into play is along Edwards between Hector and Ocean. Hmm. Otherwise, between the sea and the first public road was actually further back than the bluff edge. Cool. Thanks. Oh, and I'd love that report. I, the geologist in me would love to see that. I can geek out on that. <laughs> so Trevor, I just have a question. Um, I'm, I'm looking at figure one and I'm looking at the interface between um, the local jurisdiction and the uh, appeal area, which looks like it's right there at, um, at uh, Edwards above, um, uh, 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 above the village, but I'm looking at the north boundary of those parcels where the line doesn't uh, doesn't follow the specific um, property lines or parcel lines. Um, is that intended that way? Can you say that again, please? Okay, let's see if I explain it. So if I'm if I'm um, oh wait a minute, I did I do this right? Yeah, I'm on Edwards. And um, it's it's where the the bluff edge and the inland area. There's the the two lines are right there, the green and the red. But then I look at that little yellow box like set of parcels, and then the local jurisdiction doesn't follow specifically the parcel uh, property lines. Yeah, so that that's the one place where the 300 foot buffer from the bluff edge is okay. the is the line of the appeal area. Otherwise, it's the streets or or 100 feet from the creeks. Okay, okay. So that that gets dicey, doesn't it? Yes. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Now I understand what you're saying about that uh, 300 feet. Okay. Got it. Any other questions on figure one? Um, 
Yeah, is is the Trinidad State Park is that not considered state retained land? Should that get a crosshatch too? No, actually, um, now maybe I should crosshatch the HSU Marine Lab. So universities are a special case, um, and and the state does retain jurisdiction on the university. So maybe I should crosshatch that. But on other state-owned land, the Coastal Commission has certified the city's LCP, and so it issues coastal development permits on state land, which is unusual. So normally local jurisdictions have no authority over state lands. Um, but in the case of coastal development permits for state parks and the school, uh, we do. Okay. Good comment. Anything else on figure one? Figure two. Yes, Aaron. Um, just uh, uh, two comments, I guess. Uh, one, you know, where the open space, or excuse me, where the uh, special environment and suburban residential, you know, as you head down, seeing it kind of blur across parcels and part of the parcels one, part of the parcels the other. I, I don't, I, and I know you said you didn't want to deal with moving those lines. I don't know if it would make sense to make a parcel all one or all the other. I, I don't know if that is a complication that's even worth considering. And then uh, an overall comment on this map, getting back to um, being able to easily differentiate for anybody that sees this, particularly as we move this forward to the Coastal Commission, to the Council and onward, um, I'd like to see any of the parcels that are under on your list of proposed, perhaps cross-hatched or somehow indicated that these are changes to the existing zoning that are not yet approved if that makes sense. I think that would help me a great deal um, and others as they look at this to really understand that this map is not set in stone. There's still, I just don't want us to publish something that people think, oh, this is my, you know, um, going forward. I'm worried that with the, you know, these parcels are really small. If I tried to outline or point out all the changes, it would get a little messy. Um, we could potentially do like a draft watermark across the whole thing as opposed to just in the corner. So maybe it's more obvious that it's a draft. Or that, and then maybe a little, just a little uh, text box saying, note, there are multiple parcels on here that are indicated in a status that hasn't been approved yet. Some, you know, much cleaner than what I just said very awkwardly, um, but just something to really drive that point home. And then to your point about um, making, you know, whole parcels, I think I ideally um, zoning lines would follow parcel lines, um, but for the special environment, it's based on natural resources and natural conditions. And so that's why they don't. Um, I would not want to extend the special environment zone too much or to fill parcels because that makes the parcel much harder to, to develop. And so that would be, you know, potentially some kind of taking of private property. Um, but I also don't want to shrink the SE zone because then the Coastal Commission is going to want justification for that. And so that's why I kind of left that alone in that area. Got it. Juice is not worth the squeeze. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's it for me. Um, uh, question, uh, Trevor, and maybe I need to do some investigation. Um, the, um, public and community parcel, uh, on Patrick's point drive behind the, um, Chevron station. I don't recall that it actually goes down the way it does there on, um, well, it does there, but I didn't think it went all the way around the Snell's property. I think it does. Well, I can. I believe it does and that there's an easement for the Saunders driveway. There is, yes. 
but I, okay, I, I, that's fine. I, I'll, I'll look into that. That's, that's my, that's my thing. Okay. Anything else on figure two? Are there any questions, comments, concerns about the zoning changes and then any, any opinion on the Mill Creek parcel other than talking to the landowner? Aaron? I guess it's hard for me to answer that without having the descriptors in front of me to see what we're changing some parcels from and to on an individual basis. Um, I apologize, I did not go into that level of detail trying to do this because I wasn't sure if they were nomenclature changes or if there was a different definition I needed to be looking at or, or what. So I, I, I don't feel ready to answer that personally. Um, I can kind of go, do you want me to go through bullet by bullet and, and just summarize the reasoning for the zone changes? Yeah. Okay. So um, three already developed commercial parcels. So the eatery, the beachcomber, and then a residence on frontage road um, were commercial and they were zoned commercial because of the existing uses. So I think when the zoning ordinance was adopted, that one on frontage road was, uh, was a laundromat. Um, and now it's, it's just a residence. Um, both the beachcomber and the eatery both have sort of mixed uses, including a, a residential use in them. And so that's why the PD or the MU zone is more appropriate because commercial allows that mix of uses. And um, in the commercial zone, the only residence allowed is a caretaker unit and none of those are being used as a caretaker unit. So those are just zone changes to make them more consistent with the existing use um, and neighboring uses as well. Um, two already developed PR parcels to MU. Um, so the Presbyterian Church on Trinity and the Church on Northwest Haven Drive, those have both been purchased by private owners. The church has sold them. Um, and the owners have... Um, so the, the one, the Presbyterian Church, the owner wants it, PD, and submitted his own change application, although they've kind of withdrawn that due to the expense, um, but I know they want that. And then the one on West Haven Drive, sorry, that's the one on West Haven Drive. Um, it's being used as a residence now. It's not a church and the neighboring parcels are all zoned PD. So I just made it PD to make it consistent with the neighboring parcels. Uh, the vacant SR par parcel to MU on frontage. So again, right, real just... quick, Car uh, real quick, Trevor. Um, the PD to MU specifically, I guess the two churches. I is that a change in use, or is that again just a nomenclature one that we're talking about here? No, it's a change in the allowable uses. So in the PR zone, so so no, they're going to go from PR to PD. If you're looking at the current nomenclature pr to uh, pd okay and pd is being rebranded as mu okay yeah so pr <laughs> is public and religious so it allows schools churches um things like and public kind of civic uses um and so and not residences and currently they're being used as residences um and the mixed use allows residences um the vacant SR parcel to MU on frontage, that's just, again, consistent with the neighboring parcels. They're all zone PD. Um, so I just put that one to PD. Uh, the one already developed PR parcel to SR on Barry. Again, that's another church that has been purchased and being used as a private residence. So it makes sense to make it SR. It's consistent with the surrounding zoning. Uh, one vacant UR parcel to P. C is that is basically Parker Creek Drive, the southern, the north, the portion of Parker Creek Drive that goes north and south. That's a city owned parcel. Um, let's see, where was I? Uh, the large already developed C parcel to PC, so Saunders Park. 
Um, so that's the museum the library. So that's obviously being used as civic kind of public uses, not commercial uses. Uh, the city actually already did approve that zone change in the past, but never got it certified by the Coastal Commission. And then the Mill Creek parcel. Oh, oh and then the, the 12 and a half acres. Oh, I said 13 and a half acres. It's, it's 12 and a half acres. That's the Chirai study area, Chirai management area. Some of that area was zoned SE because it was previously privately held. And so I've just made that all open space. Um, let's see. Oh, the school. So the that's been problematic. The, the schoolyard has been zoned open space, which has made it very difficult to put in playground equipment or anything like that because open space is just difficult to develop. So it makes sense to make that more the all public. Uh, most of the harbor area, um, except along the shoreline. So basically, like I said, I I made most of the area harbor, except um, kind of following along the undeveloped shoreline areas are SE. And, and then again, the shoreline areas generally um, that are publicly owned are open space, and those that are privately owned are SE. Back to the harbor one, there's that triangle. I'm looking, you know, that 06 figure versus figure two. There's that triangle that was open space as opposed to commercial that now is being turned into harbor. So in theory, that little triangle, you know, with the vegetation there beneath the boardwalk, you know, our fancy boardwalk we've got coming down that section, right? Uh, is that where that yes, I do. I, I kind of question um, those and then also the other two that are below the ur parcels that but above what used to be bay street um i i went back and forth on those whether that sort of slope area should be something else um and i'm so yeah um that would make sense to make that area se um might make it more difficult if they need a retaining wall or something there ever, but so I don't, I don't have strong feelings about that um, either way. Trevor, if, if, um, well, I should say probably when uh, the, the Harbor area goes into federal trust, will that change any of the designations? Yeah. So, I mean, kind of, this is theoretical at this point, assuming that it's going to go into trust and then it's not going to be in the city's jurisdiction anyway um but, but and I I, my, i'm sorry i was just going to mention at the last council meeting jackie mentioned that the delay is that the the, the approval of the trust by the ba bia was appealed um i assume that was by the Yurok tribe so they are working working that out and um i i i don't know what's going to be the outcome I guess my point is um, it's it's pretty clear what the boundaries are of the property that will go into trust, but I believe that those little triangles that you're looking at are not included. So I believe uh, they those are Rancheria owned parcels. Oh, they are. Yes. Oh. So the the pink the pinkish purple triangles, yes, are part of that. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. I was thinking I was thinking that they were city owned still or would be, but. Okay. All right. That explains that. Okay. Any other questions on the uh, 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 changes in um, zoning? Clear as mud? Okay. Just to comment, I believe you said that we were going to go through these fairly quickly, Richard, but I didn't want to bring that up. No, no, no. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, we need to do our job. Yes. Okay, um, let's see. Did we have any other questions on figure one? Okay. Uh, any other questions on figure two? I had one additional question, Trevor. Uh, I did not quite understand the high water line. And where is that? It was a little difficult for me to see. And I wasn't sure if these little squiggly lines up here above North uh, Mill Creek were intended to be that high water. Is that 
Yes, actually. So, um, yeah, so there's kind of a little bit of a dash line. And again, it's it's kind of squiggly because it follows the LIDAR. So where there are sea stacks, um, you know, it kind of goes around sea stacks. It follows where bluffs or little peninsulas um, are. And so north of the city, you can see the squiggly line and you can see the squiggly line in the harbor area. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the city limit line follows it. So you can't see the squiggly line. Oh, okay. I see. Another artifact of reproduction of these <laughs> uh, figures. Okay. All right. I think I understand. Would, would there be way, do? Trevor, just for clarity, I, I don't know if this is even possible with the program, but just to pull that blue squiggle line just a fraction, you know, a millimeter you know, west, so to speak, of the heads. That way you can actually see it as a distinct element and it's not underneath the city limit layer, if that makes sense? Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I wonder if it could be like something yellow or red that can go on top of the city limit line. That might be more clear as opposed to an offset because the city limit line does follow that high water mark. Mm. Um, so that might be a way to, to do it. I can look into that. I guess my question would be more fundamental. Uh, why do we need the high water mark at all? Hmm. I mean, these are land use designations. I don't, unless I'm missing something, I don't really see what this does for me. I guess for me, it helps. Um, like, otherwise, I think the question would come up as to why you have zoning below the parcel lines seaward so that's sort of where this came up is we used to just follow the parcel lines for city limits and then we realized that those ap maps are incorrect um for the most part those parcels extend down to the high tide line mm -hmm. but that would have to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis so we didn't actually do that um so it kind of shows you the basis for why we have zoning outside of parcel lines so uh, is this the same thing as what I typically refer to as the high water mark? Yes, it's the mean, mean, mean high, high water mark. Yes. Okay, yes. that's. I think if we add that word, that will help. Ah, uh, uh, as opposed to like an individual, like this was high water in 2010. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That that helps me at least. Maybe okay. others. I don't know. Okay. Anything on figure two? Anything else on figure two? Figure three? Um, I had a one question on um, the city of Trinidad, there is the gateway parcel, which is between the southbound uh, off-ramp of the freeway and northbound um, Patrick's Point Drive, right there across from the, uh, the uh, Chevron station. And I know the city spent a lot of grant money putting in <laughs> putting in that uh, 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 base for outdoor art and did some uh, landscaping, et cetera. And that was, I believe that's city property. And uh, I don't think it shows up here as city property. It doesn't look like it shows up as a parcel. Um. Yeah, you might be right. Right. I I will look into that. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's it's unfortunate that the city hasn't done anything with it besides spend the money and then walk away, but that's an editorial comment. Um
Anything else on three? Oh uh, yeah, Aaron. I just had uh, getting back to the discussion earlier about the the island on the head for the NOAA station. Does that southern tip would that also necessarily then also be an island on the figure two for the open space because that's federal? Yes. Okay. Tom, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, figure three. Does it? I mean, I, it's getting hard for me to see here because it's getting dark. But the uh, there's the the prop city line property line goes down to Stagecoach Road to take in Mill Creek. Is that correct? Are you looking at state park property? No, I'm looking at Mill Creek where it uh, like does a little jog and goes to uh, just past the cemetery there. Oh, are you looking at the yellow line, the sphere of influence? Yeah. So that follows a parcel line. There's a parcel. So the parcel, the big parcel that's uh, up against the freeway, um, it actually ex has that little finger that extends to Stagecoach Road, I assume for access. So the sphere of influence line follows the parcel line. Does that does that give us any kind of access to Mill Creek at that location? No. Mill Creek is further south. Oh, okay. Got excited. All right, thanks. You're looking for a water source, weren't you? <laughs> Anything else on three? Okay, moving to four. Just an educational point for me, the planning area, you said uh, that was kind of relative to the watersheds. Define our planning area. What... Why is that worth knowing that that's our planning area, even though it's outside city limits, outside this sphere? But you know what I mean? I just help me. Yeah. So um, there's there's a summary in the land use element about the planning area. So um, okay. city cities are supposed to have a, a planning area in terms of this is where projects can affect the city and so the city has an interest in what goes on there um, trinidad has a very large planning area that's that's what it was in the 70s um, we've just uh corrected the line to follow watersheds and and to follow the newer data on watersheds but it always followed those watersheds um which makes some sense because if you're concerned about you know ocean water quality or whatever what happens in the upper watersheds um the only thing we really changed with this general plan update is the addition of driver road down on the south so we we kind of extended it outside our watershed boundaries into the little river watershed to pick up driver road so um, outside of that little, that little square is all zoned residential, but outside of that, it's all ag. So we just picked up the residential parcels there. Thank you. And what color is driver, the driver road area, Trevor? It's light green. It's the southern most, um, like a protuberance from the planning area down there in the south. Okay. Yeah, I have friends on Driver Road. Okay. Anything else on uh, four? Moving on to five. Uh, Trevor, I had a, a just just for explanation. I see the public facility, which are the dark blue. Um, could you just quickly say what they are? I think I recognize the um, Cal Fire one, but I, I don't know what the other two are. 
The one, the one south and the one north. The one to the south is owned by the West Haven CSD. So I think that oh. has their water treatment plant oh, on it. Oh, oh, okay, I see. Okay. The one to the north, I'm not sure. I could I could find out. That's not the um, southbound rest stop, is it? Yeah. Oh, maybe. I think so. Okay. I didn't, yeah, I was thinking, of, okay. Okay, got him. Very good. Anything else on this one? Figure six. I'll jump right in. Um, this one was a little confusing to me, uh, Trevor, and and I guess it was confusing because we show watershed boundaries. And when I first looked at this map, I was trying to see where the different creeks were. And then it seemed to me that the boundaries for some of the creeks got very confusing. But as I understand it, what is this? This is supposed to show us that there is a creek that's essentially in the middle of a watershed boundary. And it, the creek itself, though, may not be contiguous. Is that correct? Well, the line showing creeks is dashed. Do you have a specific example? Well, I was, I was trying to, like, like for example, take, um, uh, well, let, let's just take, Luffenholz. So I, I see, I guess, the northern boundary, and then it stops and, and intersects with the Jolin Creek boundary. Is that correct? Oh, I see. Okay, maybe it's just my eyesight. It does go all the way down there to scenic. Uh, I agree with Richard that it, it is a little bit confusing. Um, trying to make sense of the watershed boundaries and the creeks. I mean, maybe turning off the parcel parcel lines might clear things up on this map. I don't know that we need them on this map. Um, so you could better see the, the center lines of the creeks. Um, yeah, maybe that's, maybe that would help. That might be a good suggestion. Yeah, yeah or shade them to the background like we have in some of the other maps. Yeah, especially down in the uh, West Haven area, it gets a little little crazy, that's for sure. Yeah, and well, the parcel lines aren't, aren't in the legend either, so uh, mm. for whatever that's worth. Good, good point. Maybe, it, maybe it's suggesting we don't need them. But keep the forest and the rocks and the road. Because okay. Mill Creek, it, Mill Creek, you can't walk along the creek because it's so up and down and all the trees and, you know, then it goes down to the beach. Right, right. And, and some of these watersheds don't really have a creek. Uh, you know, these small ones right on the coast, um, you know, probably just just springs or, you know, ephemeral drainages that don't run year round. So um, especially up north, there's a lot of those. Um, and that probably it sort of adds to the busyness and confusion. OK, that might be a good suggestion. You could look at that. So, Trevor, the one that goes through um, the state park and ends up at, you know, Trinidad State Beach, is is that Mill Creek? Yeah. Okay. Any other question, comments on six? Moving on to seven, my old favorite. I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, first question is just a simple one. 
in the um, descriptor here, which starts the CNNDB, um, the third line down, then it says CNDDB. Are those two different entities? Ooh, good catch. No, it's CNDDB. Okay. It's and California it, Natural Diversity Database. That's an, uh, That would be another one that would be nice to just define on this uh, map too, so we can, okay. Okay. And, and, and then the, the, the disclosure here, I think, is what's so important because the circles don't represent really <laughs> what I think of in nature. Yeah, I mean, I guess we're required to have to create these maps. I mean, I don't, I feel like they're not, they don't provide that much like helpful information for anybody, but it's something we're just supposed to have. Is that the story there? Yes, it's typical to have maps uh, showing special status species. Uh, not a requirement though. Um, you know, it'd be used more for, you know, if parcels fall within these areas, um, they have to do special studies, but these species can exist outside these areas. So if you're in certain environments, you have to do these, you know, biological study anyway. So no, I think it's just illustrating the, the types and number of special status species in Trinidad and kind of justifying you know, why biological studies would be needed um, for projects in Trinidad, but I don't think it's a, I don't think there's a statutory requirement for them. I had a question just in general, um, maybe we can put it in the explanation or somewhere. The size, I understand from the note here that, you know, these, just represent locations where field observations have been made. Obviously they weren't made in a perfect circle, uh, somehow indicating, I, I don't know, just a, in a, you know, is it, is it the, the, the size doesn't de denote a, a frequency or a total count or intensity of species observation or? There is some, I'm, yes. Because um, I would be surprised to find bristlestock sedge in the water. Sure. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm not saying it can't blow in there, but you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Uh, I forget but, what the size of the circles indicates. But maybe yeah. we can just get that in there so we know what that size means. A lot of these CNDDB occurrences are like, they're either really old, so the mapping is poor, and it's like somewhere in that circle. Uh, uh, and then, which I think is the case, especially with the Bristol stock sedge, is it's like <laughs> an occurrence that somebody collected, you know, when in the 1800s or something like that, and they just gave a vague location data for it. Um, I also want to say that there might be some amount of obscuring the actual location of these species because they're sensitive and so okay. they don't want to give like the exact dot of where it is just so random people can't go poach it or whatnot. Sure. That makes sense. But yeah, maybe an explanation of that could be helpful if that's easy to explain. Well, part of this was done so that when someone builds in Trinidad or repurposes or redefines the land, then we know what is on the land, whether it's an animal or a plant. And Trevor's been really good at describing that in her um, reports when she gives us uh, an introduction to a project. So I, I think they're fine the way they are. To that end, could we zoom in on the city more tightly and eliminate some of the excess data that 
I mean, doesn't impact anything that we do. You know, it's, it's, if it's not within our area of control or oversight, is it really meaningful to have here necessarily as part of our general plan? I, I think that's a valid suggestion for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. It would make it a little less busy. And obviously that holds for the, the series, right? A, B, and C. Yeah. Yeah. So while we're looking at it, we can just look at all figures for seven, A, B, C. And again, that same issue of the CN and DB. Yeah, I, I think it, you know, I, well, you know, we step back and figure out what's, what's the message of these, of these figures. And, and I think what we're, I, I agree, Tristan, I think we need to focus or who said it, I'm not sure. We need to focus on Trinidad. I mean, there, we, we know that there are uh, aquatic and special status animals and, and uh, plant species all over the community. So I, I think we need to just uh, perhaps focus more on Trinidad. And it may, the way these charts are built, eliminate where some species show up. But the, the message I think is that you have to look for these things when you go to develop. I think that's what we're trying to say. Anything else on these three figures? I'll just lump them all together since they're kind of the same. Okay, figure eight. Geologic conditions. Um, I guess I had one question, Trevor. Um, I, I get the idea of the um, Aquis Periolo fault zone. I see that clearly. Down at the bottom of the figure, I see a fault boundary. And um, is, 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 is that a separate fault or is that part of Alquist? It is. It is a separate fault. So that's considered, I believe it's considered a, a historic fault that is not active, where the Alquist Priolo fault zone is considered active. And so special studies are required within that zone. Okay. Um, and then the other the other question I had was I don't mind that there's only two creeks here and the, because they're good reference to kind of give you an idea where you are on the map. But is 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 that the only reason that only two creeks are shown, the unnamed creek and Parker Creek? What's the what's the rationale for that? I didn't notice. I didn't ask. My guess would be because they're just not on the map, like at the scale that. The, the layer that the GIS person used, they're just not on the map. They'd be off, the labels would be off this map. So I, I think, because the creeks are actually there, right? It looks like Mills there, for example, it's just not labeled. Yeah, and I see uh, McConaughey Mill Creek. Yeah, Mill Creek are there. So yeah, it's just the label is probably off the map and needs to be moved. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, questions on figure eight? Yeah, is that is that little line um, representing the highway? And then the big thick fault line is out here by the head? Or no, there's the main fault line, but what's that little line representing? That's just a boundary of the fault line? The one that goes through the head? No, I'm out, I'm thinking back over by. Uh, it looks like it go follows up the highway. So you got the main fault line, and then there's a thin black line that represents something. Uh, 
Are you talking uh, about the line? Are you are you are you sure you're not seeing a, a, a blue line or a purple line? Could be a purple line. Um, like I said, it's getting dark where I'm it's getting hard to see. But so it's yeah, I think that's line. the that's the Alquist Priolo fault, I think. Mm -hmm. Is is what you're looking at. And it does kind of follow uh -huh. parallel to the highway. Okay, I got you. That's the whole area of the fault. Yeah, it's it's big. Mm -hmm. So basically, the exact location of the fault is unknown. And so the idea of these studies is so you don't build something that's actually on a fault. And so that mm -hmm. if the fault slips, you know, it would actually break up the development. Yeah, I've seen Shelter Cove stuff. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. All right. Thank you. Sorry about that. I didn't understand. Anything else on figure eight? Figure nine. I just had a question. If the planning area boundary is important to have on here, and Trevor, I'll defer to your thoughts on that. Uh, probably a color other than green, so that way it doesn't appear like there's farmland of statewide importance along the coastland. Because <laughs> at first glance, I was like, well, how do you farm there? Yeah, I um, I had a question about farmland of statewide importance. Uh, is, is that a specific definition? What does that uh, entail? What does that mean? I am not a soil scientist, but you could <laughs> you can look at the descriptions of these, and it's. You know, and these also are not exact. Um, you know, obviously they weren't they they weren't out there digging pits to figure out all these boundaries, though though they did dig some pits um, to describe the soils. But it'll be you know it'll be composed of primarily one type of soil with minor components of others. Um, you know, it has to do with a lot of it has to do with the drainage. Um, you know, and that it's a, a, a loam soil. It has the right mix of clay, sand, and um, silt in it. Um, but there are other factors as well, like uh, uh, slopes, I think, um, some other things. So I don't know what all the factors are that go into that, um, but it is a, an official designation in the soil description. So um, just, just again, real fast, uh, the numbers which are in each of these uh, areas, is that just supposed to be some sort of reference designator? Um, yeah, so there is a soil. I do have a soil report for this that um, includes all these numbers and that includes the NRCS description for each of them. So these are all soil units and you can match those units to a soil description. Okay. All right. Hey, following up on that, I kind of had the same thought. I don't know if that would be worth in just noting some of the explanation or removing the numbers entirely and just leaving the colors in and saying discrete information on soil, you know, is available with the city or something. I don't know, to make it maybe a little less busy and more meaningful. I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I kind of like to have the numbers in you know, just then I can go look up the soil, but uh, for other people, you know, who's, who's really going to do that? So yeah, maybe, maybe just the colors. But if it works for you to have it there, then just a little thing noting how you convert those numbers into something meaningful. If somebody has a lot of spare time <laughs> and doesn't have to do it professionally. <laughs> Okay, figure nine, anything else? Figure 10. Trails. I like that it's just the trails. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's conveying one thing and it's doing it 
well, I think, you know, shows the tracing of them. Yeah, it's a very important component of the LCP for Coastal Act compliance. I, I hate to ask, is there, would there be any benefit given the scale of this? And I particularly appreciate it's the, you know, the large format 11 by 17. Um, the, the names of the trails for those that do have names. And I know I just said I appreciate the simplicity of it. And now I'm asking you to add more data. So I recognize. <laughs> We have talked about that. I think, you know, we were talking about the, some of the recreation components of the conservation element around the same time that the trails policy was being discussed. And I think we decided to leave it general in the general plan. Uh, and in the trails policy, they kind of group they group the trails by location. So, um, so there's the Harbor trails. So the ones that lead to the Harbor, there's the old home beach trails that lead to the, and so I was thinking a map that sort of color codes those by group would be nice um, in order to have the descriptions. I do like the idea of have, having trail names. Uh, I guess, with all, so one of the things we did was add connections on the streets to all the trails. So, you know, I don't know where does the Underwood Trail end and where does the Parker Creek Trail end first, you know, does it go down? So that was, so if you added labels, what's the extent of that name trail? I, and I don't know that we have those. And so, that's one of the reasons I left them off. Um, I think it would be nice to have them better labeled or categorized. I'm just not sure the best way to do that. That could be maybe 10A, 10B, 10C down the road with little flyouts, detailed sections, so to speak. I don't know. No? Um, the Van Weck Trail, that's, that's not correct anymore, right? Well, it's still officially a trail. It is. Yes, it has and not been permit. It has not been permanently closed. Oh, really? And uh, is I've always heard that the right by the parking lot for a little ways up the beach is the Humboldt County, and that state land goes in a little further north. Am I in, not correct with that? Where where is that? On the beach, it says Trinidad State Beach. Yes, it's all a state beach. But is it true that Humboldt County owns part of that? No, um, not all of it is in State Park, though. So if you go back to Figure Figure Two, might show it the best. So the dark green portion is, is, is the state park portion. And then south of that is Rancheria property. As, as far as I know, like I said, most of these areas, this is an area where the beach extends much further than the mapped parcel lines. Yeah. Um, for the most part, uh, through court court decisions, those lines were mostly all extended to the high tide line, but and not it's all part of the beach. So it's fine. Yeah. 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 This looks great. I'll just make one comment on um, uh, nomenclature. Um, while I think the trails in the main part of town would be acceptable to name. I think we find ourselves having difficulty with uh, Native American uh, nomenclature. And uh, it's, I, I think you're right. I think it's best to leave that alone until that there's some final agreement on signage and, and uh, if and when that ever happens. So um, yeah, I like this. <laughs> Diane. 
And I, I think just the dotted line or the broken line is enough for the trail. If we um, start adding names, it, it's going to be too much, too much to read. We can put up the sign that says trail in the city with the um, arrow and then just not worry about the names like Richard said. And one of the one of the uh, trail signs on Parker Creek um, Drive was knocked over by a big trailer in a truck this summer. But our great city people put it right back up, and I think the people did give the city some money. Mm. Yeah, we we all told them it'd be a good idea to contact the city. Okay, anything else on 10? And I will just an update. Um, I did attend the last couple Chirai management team meetings because some city staff were unavailable. I don't normally attend those on a regular basis, but they are working on some, some signs that will I mean, focused on the, the Churai management area for now, but that will serve as a model for for signs around town um, so that they can all be consistent. So um, there is there is some work being done on trail signs. Good, great. So that's on the head or on the way to the head? Is that um, no, like the Old Home Beach trails, like oh, okay. Lindgren and Parker. Okay, thank you. Figure 11. I just had one question again. It doesn't really make a big difference to me, but I was just trying to figure the rationale for showing the streets, uh, the uh, local streets down in the Rancheria. I mean, it's fine if you want to leave it there. I just didn't understand what that rationale was for. Fine. I think, I think just for completeness. That's fine. Yeah. I just, just want to make sure I understood what was happening. Anything else on this one? Moving on to 12. And uh, this was the one that, Trevor, you mentioned that um, there are some changes to benches. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry. I just went through and I included all the figures instead of the one that I made notes on. Um, so yeah, there's a couple of benches on the west side of Trinidad Head that um, are not on the map. And then most, uh, the benches along Edwards, like below between Trinity and, and Van Wyck are not there. And the Benches on the upper part of the Axel Lindgren Trail, so the middle of the trail, are also not there. Um, they have been removed. Okay. And the and the bench that's shown as proposed at the base of Galindo is is there. And then also the one um, is that Wagon Road? Is that what that's referred to? That trail. Oh, and that one's gone. That too. one also is either obscured with vegetation, Diane, or missing. Hmm. Okay. And then you also asked for recommendations for um, bike racks. Yeah, I mean, I think this is an opportunity. The city has this this money that I'm not sure, you know, partly because of, you know, it takes so long to do projects especially dealing with trails these days um it has this money that um is not allocated so they're going to do some improvements to um, the tennis courts to make it a pickle pickleball also court and some other improvements um but um i think bike racks would be an easily eligible activity and i think would have high value um, and I think some bike lockers or some covered bike racks or something like that. And, you know, maybe by the bus stops, maybe down in the harbor, seems like, 
town hall. Um, anyway, so I'm, I'm looking for some input on on that, and I think we could, you know, give those recommendations to Eli and, and Becky and, and see if they can get some some park bond funds for that. Um, Chairman Johnson, this is Patty Fleshner. Can you hear me? Yes, Patty. Um, on back on figure 11, um, the road classification, is it possible to go back to figure 11? I just noticed that um, Jan Court, J-A-N-I-S, Court off of Patrick's Point Drive isn't um, shown on the map. And then you know, on South Scenic Drive, the little dotted lines um, just to the northwest of Langford, that's Growth Lane, G-R-O-T-H Lane. That's not marked. And then the road going up to Trinidad Head and the Lighthouse, that's called Lighthouse Road. Is it important to have those roads marked? Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank, thank you, Patty. Um, I was curious on, on uh, the figure with the trails or the benches. Um, who pays for benches? And why, I mean, if the money is not allocated, could, could it go to some benches? Potentially, uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, benches, so the, the city does have some policies for benches. Um, some, some the city just has put in, but a lot of the benches have been paid for by someone who dedicates the bench. Um, and the city is working on, on some policy for, you know, how long the dedication lasts and, and those sorts of things. They're kind of looking at that right now. Um, but yeah, I, I think the money could potentially be used for benches too. Aaron. Great. Um, just four suggested locations that I think might be, um, easy, <laughs> uh, the library, uh, the tennis courts, one at the harbor, and then one in the state park uh, parking lot there. I don't think there's any there. I don't know if the state, how, what kind of sticky wicket that is, but those are ones, you know, there, like I said, there is none in the harbor, even though it indicates. So, you know, by the tennis courts, I'm just trying to think where people come to town on their bikes and stop and have, you know, enjoy our businesses and our services. And we've got no place for them to secure their bike or their belongings and maybe a hybrid between a couple covered ones or, um, might be a good place to use those. There, Aaron, there is a bench in the state park on the a on bike the rack. Oh, you're doing bike racks. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if, um, you know, maybe the Ewing Street right of way in front of the Marine Lab might be a good. Uh, they have that city. They property. have a couple of the. They have a couple bike lock. Oh, they do in front, okay. of, the, in front okay. of the Marine Lab. Yeah, I've I've. Locked a bike there before, recently. <laughs> yeah, the only the only uh, ad I might have is those are all good locations. Um, and you mentioned the library. Uh, there's also Saunders Park. It's almost the same thing. And um, then uh, getting back to the uh, that little piece of property which is at the gateway. Um, initially we had, not initially, but several years ago, we had bike lockers there and, um, they, they were pretty problematic though. Um, they were not very secure to begin with. Uh, they were always being damaged or broken into, uh, just because it was something that was locked. You know, people just had to figure out what was inside. Um, so I, I guess what I'm trying to say is um, I really appreciate getting bike racks. I am not a big fan of bike lockers. I think it, it's just adding to a, a problem that we have. So, but I'm not, I'm not I agree with Richard. We just let's start with four bike racks areas, four places, and then 
People have their fanny packs. They carry their own stuff. They're pretty light travelers, people that bike. Those locks, yeah, the they would be picked and broken into. Uh, yeah, I agree with that um, about the lockers. I don't know that... I don't know. The only place I could think of maybe there being a benefit to there being a locker is at Murphy's, but I could see how it could just um, cause maybe more problems. But I, I do think Murphy's would be a good place for a bike rack. I know there's one behind Salty's, but it's sort of awkward. Location. But that's, that's the only place. There are too many cars all the time, every day in the parking lot. It's going to have to be over by Salty's because there's some open ground on the other side of that second parking lot, the back parking lot by the Lighthouse Grill and Salty's. That's where we used to have a visitor stand with brochures. So that would be a good place. Um, and then the homeless will hang all their stuff on it. Yeah, my one concern with bike racks is if we don't put them in the right place, no one will use them. Like they need to be convenient. And that, even if that means, I mean, I, we don't have jurisdiction over the Murphy's parking lot as far as I know, but like if you put a bike rack in the middle of a, what used to be a parking spot right in the front, then people will put their bikes on it. But if you put it around the side, people are just going to lock their bikes to whatever things closest to the front door of Murphy's. That's um, a good point. Yeah. Maybe near the, uh, bus stop maybe near the bus stop yeah i also like the flagpole as a location for a bike rack a lot of people ride their bikes to the flagpole mm. maybe they want to go down to the beach and they need a place to to lock it and one of the uh, native americans talked months years ago about putting some benches and making a little park right there at the flagpole so we need to get or maybe I'll get in touch with Allie Lindgren and we can see about a couple benches and then, you know, the bike rack there sounds good. And okay. Any other uh, 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 suggested locations? Uh, just the Harbor, maybe two, one at the Harbor by the restaurant and one at the state beach side. Sure. Or the trailhead where they start walking up the head. Okay, anything else on 12? 13? This was one that we looked at just recently, right, Trevor? Yeah, and you had some comments. Um on the symbology for the storm water components so the colors have been changed so they're a little bit easier to differentiate um, the drainage arrows have been added throughout town instead of just more in the central stormwater area and then i also added these lid areas so the idea here there it's it's not exactly perfected but um the idea here is that within the pink area we don't allow lid within the clear area the blue area we can encourage lid and then in the yellow area it's outside the study area and so it would require additional studies And this is based on the uh, groundwater model that GHD developed as part of the stormwater project. So um, the, the model is, is difficult to run. It takes a lot of work to run, um, apparently. So they sort of have to pick, they can't just run infinite um, scenarios. And so they kind of pick this scenario based on what they know and it turned out it worked out so that you can infiltrate as much as you want in that blue area and it's not gonna affect bluff stability, it's not gonna affect septic systems, it's not gonna affect anything else. 
Um, within the pink area, they've kind of maxed out the stormwater infiltration with the city's stormwater project. And then in the yellow area, it's outside the groundwater. Can you refresh what LID stands for? Yes, a uh, good question. That's low impact development. And so it would be uh, infiltrating stormwater. So, you know, instead of your roof runoff um, running into the storm drain or off into the street, as an example, um, you could do a rain garden. Or so it's it's basically trying to more naturally mimic storm flow from impervious surfaces. Thank you. Yeah, Aaron. Uh, just on, and this is getting a lot more clear from the last one, but just by way of an example on Main Street, right? There's those two boxes connected by the green stormwater pipe just to the left of the word main street there i'm i'm trying to understand what those are, are they stormwater in it i don't see anything on a legend that has a black a black and white 50 percent black 50 percent white on that and that's a few spots on the map elsewhere i'm just trying to understand what that is That's a good question. I don't, I don't know. Cause the, the one to the West seems clear. That's just a storm. Right. Inlet. But yeah, what is the black on the main street ones? Okay. Cool. Thanks. Good catch. And like I said, there throughout, if you follow the, you know, all the way down Edwards and whatnot there elsewhere throughout the city. Yeah. Um, I think I had this comment last time about storm drains and whatnot surrounding the 101 interchange and the um, frontage road. I don't. Maybe we just don't have data on that, or I don't know. If it's just. I mean, that side of the city is not included. I guess. Yeah, I think part of it we don't have data. There are some Caltrans culverts. You know, I think what comes down Frontage Road is all from seeps and it just kind of sheet flows, but I believe there is a storm drain on 101 somewhere. There's I, one I'm on the front that, of too, but yeah. In that, under the overpass. I will ask GHD about that. Okay. Yeah, there's clearly one right there at the uh, northbound off-ramp right there to the um, to the left as you come off the freeway. So I know it's there. Yeah. Yeah, there's one further north on the frontage road before you get to Barry. Yeah, right. This might be a, maybe that's just a culvert, I guess. But and the and the other thing, uh, I, I guess this what this map is intended to show is what's connected, if you will. And I don't know that those are part of this system. Right. True. But probably what comes down front edge and the 101 off ramps, that probably ends up making its way to Parker Creek. So no. it seems like it should be included. I will ask. All right. Thanks. Anything on 13? Anything else on 13? Okay. Last but not least, map we looked at last week or last month, figure 14. And Richard, I did note your comment in the minutes about adding the letters to the sub areas here. So I do have that noted. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, in the legend you of this map, there's planning area parcels and parcel boundaries. I guess we oh. just 
could probably get rid of yeah yeah hairy parcels and then uh the fire hydrant on Barry Road is actually at the intersection of Barry and Himalaya ah okay Anything else? One fourteen. Okay, if there are no other comments, uh, I'll open it up for public comment on this uh, agenda item. Is there any public comment? We did get one public comment from Patty earlier. Thank you. Okay, hearing no further public comment, I'll bring it back to the commission. Any final comments or considerations on this agenda item? Okay, next, ended, uh, next agenda item. <laughs> Uh, housing related zoning ordinance update discussion regarding a zoning ordinance amendment to add provisions for reasonable accommodations to the zoning ordinance. Uh, Trevor, yeah, um, or uh, just one second. I'm sorry, Diane, you have something. I, I am leaving the meeting, I have a very early morning commitment and I hurt my shoulder. So, good night. I will see you next month, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Yeah, is there is there any way we could put this one off? It's getting <laughs> difficult for me to see this thing too up here where I'm at. I was is the power out in Trinidad or something? Tristan, you look like you're in the dark too. I just like the low light. Okay. <laughs> um, actually, I was I was gonna start off this item and say there's no rush on this. I know it's getting late and. You know, ordinances are kind of um, he heavy to, to go through. So, no, there there is no rush on this. Um, you know, if you want to start asking some questions or whatever, that's fine. Or if you want to put it off to next month, that's fine, too. I'd be happy to bring it next month. I'd second that, actually. Well, okay. Sounds like uh, I don't think we need a vote, but it sounds like we have concurrence at least that uh, we can put this off. Thank you. I don't have power where I'm at, so it's getting it's getting tricky. <laughs> oh my. Okay. Um, okay, then we'll move on to uh, the next uh, agenda item, which is commissioner reports. Anything to report from the commissioners? Um, we're, we're the trails committee. Um, we're working on, I think, I can't remember if I gave a report on it or not since the last meeting, but anyway, we're working on benches and thank you, Aaron, for all the hard work you did with the benches. And that looks great. And, uh, I, I but we're, we're looking at how to do the benches open for ideas and, um, yeah, glad to hear. Glad to hear signs are moving forward. And but the, yeah, that's that's about it. And Trevor, I'll be getting in touch with you in regards to those, the benches. Um, thank you. That's it. Thank you, Tom. Anything else yep. from anyone? Upcoming uh, water advisory committee. If anybody has anything they want me to find out or ask, feel free to send me an email, and I'll bring that to them. It's date isn't set yet, but September, October, somewhere in that frame. Okay, thank you. All right, um, moving on then to staff report. I don't think I have much new to report. I'm just uh, continuing, obviously, to work on LEAP and SB2 tasks um, with these 
with these figures. I think I'm ready for the most part to submit a new round of elements to Coastal Commission and responses to comments to them. Um, and I have started working on uh, the cultural resources element under the LCP update grant. I sent out some letters uh, to the tribal entities asking, you know, for for their participation, how they want to participate in that. Um, so hoping to, to start up some informal consultation on that. That's the first task on that grant. So, um, and I have not heard any updates on the Vanderpool project, but I I know they are working on some new plans. So just to clarify, they did not appeal. They did and then withdrew the appeal a few days later. Oh, okay. Hmm. All right. Yeah, I, I, the reason I asked, I heard conflicting reports. That's I just wanted to clarify. Okay. All right. Any, okay, so that's uh, staff reports. And then future agenda items. We have one, two, three, four, five items on the agenda for future for the future. Are there any others that we want to consider or entertain at this point? Just as an update on, on the first one there, I was actually going through the management plan today, um, looking at put, putting some of those recommendations into the cultural element. Oh, okay. Very good. All right, uh, any final comments or considerations from the commission? Okay, well, hearing none, thank you very much. Another productive night, appreciate your participation and we'll see you next month, if not before. Bye everybody. Good night. Thanks, good night.